Welcome, everyone. Hi, I'm Henry DeVries, and you're on the Marketing with a Book podcast. Not the Marketing a Book podcast. I'm sure that's great. We're the Marketing with a Book podcast. This is about how agency owners and business coaches, strategic consultants, how they attract high paying clients by marketing with a book and a speech. The book is the number one tool for finding new clients. Speaking about the book is the number one sales strategy to land those clients. Thank you for being with us today. We have a group of our authors from Indie Books. We'll be introducing them in just a moment. And then we have one of our authors, a special guest today to talk about his success with his first book and also to give us a sneak peek into his new book that'll be coming out very soon. So with that, I'd like to do the author roll call and introduce people. Um, uh, Craig, you're gonna be our speaker today, but introduce your book and then we'll go to David and then uh, Chris and Steve. Thank you, Henry. My name's Craig Lauder. I currently live in Chicago for one more week. I'll be living in Milwaukee next week. Uh, my first book was Smooth Selling Forever, which was published back in uh, 2016, targeting small and mid-sized business owners. Uh, my upcoming book is Trusted Advisor Confidential, which is focused on audience of coaches, consultants, authors, and speakers. And thanks for being with us today, Craig. Um, go Packers. Uh, Craig's, uh, Craig's going to be a recovering Chicago Bears fan. Uh, how about uh, David, please? Thanks, Henry. Hi, I'm David Goldman, and I'm in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, because it's summer. And uh, I wrote the book, uh, The Road to Happiness, How to Get What You Really Want. And I'm very excited about an upcoming book that uh, Henry, Mark LeBlanc, and I co-wrote called uh, Bringing in the Business Without Feeling Like a Salesperson. Thanks, David. Um, let's talk about your target audience. Who's really the target audience? I'm thinking of the two main ones for you on bringing in the business. Well, my, my targets are financial advisors and attorneys. Uh, there's an occasional accountant thrown in, but it's really professionals who want to bring more business in. And most of the time, professionals don't want to feel like salespeople. I'm really excited about the book because the message is enroll, don't sell. Enroll, exactly. don't sell. So if you think of somebody going to a prestigious university, um, we've got some represented here. They get enrolled. You know, they didn't get sold a seat at Notre Dame. So you get enrolled. And, and that's the same philosophy in the book. So we're looking forward to that and to having you on and to be a special guest on one of the podcasts and just explaining the main messages of that book. So thanks. So Thank uh, Parisa, welcome. Hello everyone, uh, Parisa Bania, uh, the Business Whisperer Success Strategy. Uh, my upcoming book, which is I'm really excited about, it's called uh, Modern Badass Tales from the Leadership Front. And it is for those disruptors, change agent, pattern interrupters, that go 80 miles an hour in a 45 mile an hour zone without checking to see if their people are strapped in for the ride, let alone interested in the destination. Uh, really happy to be with all of you here today and uh, learn from the best. Thank you so much. Uh, and uh, Craig Lauder introduced us. So that was a nice introduction. That's and exactly right. I enjoyed editing your book. Um, you're a contrarian. I am. You own it. So uh, it's, it's a provocative title and with full intent. So looking forward to the launch. Thanks for being here. Me too, today. thank you. Well, one of our big advocates uh, in the books, one of our authors and somebody we really support his work, uh, Stephen Brody. Welcome, Stephen. Hi, hi, Henry. Hello, everyone. Um, my book recently uh, published a few years ago is called What Happens what happens after the sale? And it's about insights uh, into the, the personal and business journey after the big events that the, the founder goes through. I had an interesting experience. I wrote 
Stephen up and we mentioned his admiration for Vern Harnish, if uh, some of you know who Vern is. Um, and Vern reached out to me uh, right after that column and we talked and uh, uh, he appreciated. So you never know uh, what the ripple effect of your book is going to be. Well, let's bring on our guest today, Craig Louder. Uh, want to welcome Craig, a uh, good buddy, and uh, happy to be the uh, co-author of his upcoming book. Um, I wanted to talk about smooth selling forever. You're a bit of a contrarian. I'll never forget the time you attended one of our marketing with a book and speech summits in, in the suburbs of Chicago, um, way out yonder, we were there. And we really developed the idea that day and uh, developed into this book. You're a contrarian, Craig. Uh, so many people are worried about the book sales. You're not worried about it at all. Could you talk about your philosophy in that? Well, I was educated by one of the best. I don't know if you know Henry DeVries or not, and Mark LeBlanc, but they're good guys. Uh, but the reality uh, of the situation, they told me that most people don't sell more than 500 books. Uh, yes, the very good books can get picked up by a major publisher. But the way I view this, this is my business card. This is my calling card. This is what opens the door. This is what separates me from those that believe that I'm in competition with them. And what I found with the book, it leads itself to speaking, gosh, the number one strategy, uh, particularly to small groups. It leads to client engagements and the three different profit centers that I employ. But I use the book as a giveaway, a credibility builder, because there's not too many of us out there in the world that have published books. And even though I tell people what's on Amazon, they go, it's on Amazon? How did you ever get to do that? And I said, well, in private, they'll publish anything they can make a book on or they will promote anything. So it's not that, it's not that big a deal, but I found it's had an incredible impact on the overall growth of my business and my ability, quite frankly, leads uh, land speaking engagements. Craig, you reminded me of when I started my business and people were so impressed that I was an entrepreneur and started a business. And I said, you too could cash in your 401k and put it all on the line with a business if you wanted. Uh, so yeah, so uh, authors between us, you know, we're, we don't think we're that special, but to people who haven't written that book they wanted to write and you did it and got it out there, uh, you are special. Uh, tell us about some of the doors the book opened for you. If we're talking about speaking, uh, it opened a variety of groups from Vistage to executive forums to the Turnaround Management Association to uh, associations uh, where the focus of their business is really on generating and, and growing sales. And what I found out there, there are a gazillion books out there and there are a lot of good speakers that talked about the tactics of sales, the, uh, you know, the anatomy of a sales call, but putting the strategic infrastructure in place that enables people to close more sales faster and generate significant, predictable and sustainable sales growth. There's not much out there. And I found that I was pretty much in my own lane. I think what made your book different and when you get into people's hands and, and, and please don't understand me, uh, Craig gets the books into people's hands who can make a decision. Um, he's just not worried about them spending $20 on Amazon to get the book. Uh, he doesn't wait to be discovered by these people. He lets them have the book. When they get the book, it was your defining stories was the asset that yes. nobody else had. You had stories that proved you knew how to take a small to medium business and take it on a journey where they could get predictable sales results. It wasn't hoping and praying 
it was a predictable process and you had story after story after story with real numbers on how that worked. Um, your thoughts on the stories. Uh, that is exactly the critical element in the book. So we present concepts and then we validate those concepts with real world stories in the audience that we're talking to. So it adds a lot of validity to, yeah, this guy is just not somebody who thought something up, but he's never proven anything. So what we did in the book is made sure that for every key point that we're trying to make, we had a legitimate story with numbers that validated what we were teaching. That's something I admire about you. You're a numbers guy. You have measurable results. I mean, right down to the cover, it's talking about predictable and sustainable sales growth. And um, to quote Deming and God we trust, all others must bring data. You brought data, you brought numbers. What was, it remind me, um, the range of sales increases you had recorded uh, with those companies. We talked about it, I think in chapter two. Yeah, I think a couple of the key metrics, uh, my conversion rate, from being introduced to someone to actually closing a sale. It went from less than 20% conversion rate from just an introduction or a lead to closing a sale to 50%. And if I was able to engage someone in my sales process, meaning that we did a discovery session, the close rate grew to over 90%, which is to me was just unfathomable that that would happen but I can also attribute directly to the book or indirectly to the book, approximately 800 and I think it's 43 or $846,000 in income over a period of three years that I would not have gotten or I would have gotten significantly less than that if it wasn't for the book. Craig does something and he demonstrates it in the book and it's, what I call the strategy of gathering measurable results testimonials, where you can get the client to agree to use numbers. Usually sales volume data, people don't like to give away. Percentages, people are more willing to give you. And he has one in the book about uh, in the first six months, their average sales ratio, success ratio was 7%. His second six months, 20%. Uh, and the percentage change overall, 285%. So it's not just, you did a great job. You really helped us. You made a difference. Um, sometimes you have to go back to the client and interview them and have them give you numbers. Uh, I just had a client where I went back to the client, and I said, well, what happened as a result of the book? A lot of us are afraid to ask this question. We're afraid of a reckoning. <laughs> and this one, he said, oh, I never told you. Um, you helped us to get first over a million dollars a year in revenue, and then we parlayed it into $2 million a year in revenue. And we've done that for the last seven years. Like I said, could I put that in writing? He said, sure, shoot me an email. I did, he approved it. So this is just something I didn't, I didn't invent this. I, I learned things from Craig too. That's one of the great things about writing these books and editing these books and publishing is that I learned a lot. Well, let's talk about the next book because you're helping these businesses, but there's this other group that you feel akin to, you wanted to help them. And tell us what is the title of the next book and what is the main message of that book? The, the new book is called Trusted Advisor Confidential and how to attract clients that pay big bucks. And I'm paraphrasing what it says. And what I discovered in my journey from the first book, along with speaking, connecting with people who can open the door to, within your target audience is critical. And what I found them to be is they're primarily trusted advisors, bankers, accountants, other coaches, uh, architects, 
on and on and on. And I found out that they were all struggling the same as a small and mid-sized business owners. They did not have a system for generating new clients. And that's the lifeblood of their business to build a strong book of business, which allows them to earn the income that they'd like to, to address the, uh, the, the fantasies, the, uh, uh, what, what shall we say, the, uh, uh, what they really want out of life. And so what I found out, it's like, oh my goodness, the same principles for small and mid-sized business owners can also be used with trusted advisors. And I call them the stars using the metaphor of sailing. You know, ancient, ancient mariners use the stars to start their journey. Today, coaches, authors, um, other trusted advisors, they also need to navigate the complex buying process of their clients or customers. And there are six stars that if they follow them, they will build a strong book of business and they will see that their personal income and overall happiness in life will spike up. Well, now you've got everybody interested. Uh, we got to give them the stars. Why don't you give us the six stars to guide? Them? Okay, and it's in order and it's really hierarchical. Uh, number one is targeting. You've got to target the right clients. All clients are not created equal. So you need to take a look at the geographic characteristics, the demographic characteristics, the psychographic or behavioral characteristics of your best clients so that you can focus on attracting more of those and equally understanding what a bad client looks like so you don't invest too much time with them. And uh, the results, and it applies to all six stars, is you'll get higher lead to sales conversion rates, you'll get shorter sales cycles, you'll get larger sales, more profitable sales, uh, more cost-effective lead generation strategies, and, and you'll build value-based relationships. So that's targeting, and that's the first proactive step, is you need to know who you want to do business with. Now, we also call it, you know, who and what is their problem? Right. And when you've been talking to trusted advisors, and I've been interviewing trusted advisors, and I've looked at other statistics, um, I'm finding that, according to survey data, they're the number one pain point for these people, three out of five, is finding new clients. It's an ongoing struggle uh, and they're looking for that. And um, your other steps to walk them through this journey of how to ratchet that down. What, what are some other stars you want to point out? So other stars, the second star is once you know who you're going to go, what to go after is messaging. What message do you want to communicate to those people that resonates with them where they're raising their hand and they can't wait to hear more and learn how you might be able to benefit them. Third, client acquisition process mapping. It needs to be documented. It's a workflow. It's a series of documenting best practices that you've experienced over the years that generates a straight path from lead to conversion. And along with the book and along with my process mapping, those are the elements that got me to 90% conversion rate. Um, you need to eliminate wasteful steps. So it's all about effectiveness and efficiency. Uh, the four star is having a client acquisition scorecard. What are the activities that you need to generate in order to receive the results? Activities are leading, leading indicators of success Results are lagging indicators. So activities might be calls. It might be proposal. It may be the health of your sales funnel or pipeline. Uh, it could be a number of other factors. And results are typically are, you know, uh, new clients, uh, income generated against some metric. But it's just, I like to say, it's like playing around a golf, Henry. It's if I want to get better at golf, what do I practice? 
Well, I want to get a lower score on the hole in the round. Those are results. Leading indicators are, if I'm going to get better at golf, I need to hit the gosh darn fairway, which is difficult for me to do. And then I need to get on the green and regulation. And then I need to minimize the putts that I take on each hole. So I practice those three things. And if I get proficient at one or more of them, my score is going to go down. Uh, the fifth is lead generation. Uh, Henry, and you said it, the, the struggle that most trusted advisors have is acquiring new clients. So what lead generation techniques do I use? And I'm a big advocate. You should have a minimum of five, if not 10. It's like a good investment portfolio. So we know as speakers and coaches and authors, speaking to small scale seminars, having a book, networking with the right people, building the right, what I call the connector compass, the right connectors that have a direct line into your target audience. This will help you become more efficient and more effective at lead generation and save your most precious resource, your time. And then finally, the six star is feeding the funnel. And I think I've heard you say it, Henry, it's like uh, shampoo, Lather, yeah, it's, uh, rinse, it's, repeat. lather, rinse, repeat, lather, rinse, repeat. So the whole idea is to continue to feed your pipeline, bringing in new opportunities in the funnel, working them down the funnel to the point of closure. And I think the big challenge with everything that we do, too many people in business development are afraid to lose. And lose means they don't get a deal. In the reality, they should be looking at the amount of time that they're investing because that's their most precious and diminishing resource that they have. So they've got to walk away from opportunities that are not good fits and grab on to those that are great fits and just find more of them. Well, the only thing we control is our time and what we do with it. There's a, a Dilbert cartoon I like a lot and it's the female executive talking to the boss and the boss says, you know, I, I need you to be putting in 200 hours a week on this. And she said, there are only 168 hours in a week. And he says, well, I expect your family to contribute some hours too. So we only get 168 hours and we got to sleep with some of those. So as you said, it's, it's the, it's the resource that vanishes every day. And how, how do we spend our time? How do we invest it? It's what we control. And that's a lot of what the process is talking about is uh, you're getting the scores, but I mean, going back to the golf example, uh, the only thing I can control to lower the number of putts is I need to spend time practicing putting and, and get down to where instead of three putts, I'm averaging two putts. And that would save 18 strokes around. Anyway, so you don't have to be a golfer to follow the logic. It's, you need to be recording what you do. Um, I know on our team, uh, Suzanne and I, we just had a conversation about how many people are we gonna invite on LinkedIn to link in with us? Then how many people are we going to invite to be our guest at this event. Um, we're looking at how many emails are we gonna send out a week? And are we measuring, does the list get exhausted? Uh, these are all things that you have to take into account. Um, Craig, what I like about your thinking is you're a systems thinker. Um, you explain it well, you break it down. Uh, sort of like uh, Forrest Gump's mother, you know, you can just say it where, I, I understand it. So you're breaking it down. Life is like a box of chocolates. So you're breaking it down into easily understandable steps. And if you do the steps, if you control the activity, you will get results. So yeah, um, what other advice do you have to share with, uh, because this is, this is your audience here. These are who attends these podcasts. So two parts, number one, you need to have a system. And in the upcoming book, it's going to be branded the Navstar Client Acquisition System. And it involves these six steps. And if you diligently do what you need to do through the tools that I'm going to give you 
to help you decide on what your target should be and what your message should be. If you develop that and you diligently execute it, you have rigor and discipline around it, it's going to work. And how do I know that? I was on a 40 plus year experience. I feel I've invested over 80,000 hours in learning. And this is what I learned. And towards the last 15 years, like, oh, there is a system here. There is something that's repeatable. The other thing, so have a system, execute it. But I also want to say, don't get unconsciously competent because the world changes. We get lazy. We need to be prepared to review this system and the components of the system on a regular basis and make revisions as necessary. And revisions are usually based on best practices. What have I learned? What should I continue to do? What should I stop doing? What should I start doing that I'm not doing? Let's try it and see if it's more effective. Something that's very popular out there uh, from the book uh, Tr Traction by Gina Wickham is the uh, EOS operating system. And I believe um, their focus is on quarterly. You should review things quarterly. I think uh, Dan Sullivan's strategic coach focused a lot on quarterly. Is your review based on quarterly or monthly or, or yearly? What, how often do we review the system? The answer is yes. So measurements need to be taken weekly. It needs to be measured monthly as well as quarter, quarterly, potentially semi-annually, and definitely worst case annually. I highly recommend that you do it on a quarterly basis. If it's a matter of just sitting back with a cup of coffee and just looking at your results and thinking about what well and what went well and what didn't, and what do I need to do differently to become more effective? So it's an iterative process. Yeah. In, in our book, uh, build your consulting practice. Uh, Mark LeBlanc and I wrote definitely you need to track your numbers and know your numbers. And it was interesting, Craig, when we used to put on these events and seminars and teach people this uh, in the book, those are the first two things. But we found if we talked to trusted advisors about those first two things, we were losing them. We, we reversed it and talked about the fun things with marketing and lead generation and then got back to these fundamentals on tracking and knowing your numbers uh, and then people could accept it. So you, you, you're fighting the fine fight there. Um, in, uh, in California, we teach people that the universe rewards activity. And when I'm out there in the Midwest in uh, Chicago and now uh, I, I hope to see you in Milwaukee, we'll teach people that the Lord helps those who help themselves. So you have to be out there with this system and, and tracking it to tweak it. Um, because you, one more, you, you one more comment, yeah. one more comment or bias. Um, I don't believe you turn on the lead generation machine until you're good at converting. And I like to say it's like taking a bucket, uh, empty bucket to the water pump and prime it, but your bucket has holes in it. Yeah. And yet you're thirsty. Why, why pump what leads into it when you're going to lose them? You don't have a good job, good to convert. So I say, focus on conversion first and then ramp up your lead generation efforts. I worked with Michael Gerber at the EMIP Academy, uh, even one-on-one -on -one with Michael and then the team. And I was very impressed with what they taught is first, you have to focus on delivering the promise that your business says it will deliver. You know, and if it's if it's a McDonald's hamburger or or whatever, you have to be able to do that. Then you have to convert leads. You have to get very good at that. Then you do lead generation, and finally, it's branding. Uh, but people want to get that order wrong, and they want to go branding, lead generation, then learn how to convert them, and then finally learn how to deliver. It's just like it messes everything up, and you get a horrible reputation that way. So thank you for, for sharing that, pointing that out. Um, before we go, I, I wanna share, a, I want you to share a fun story. Um, and I, I, I set you up before the call, so you'll know what the fun story is. Um, tell us about uh, an encounter with uh, greatness that you had. You mean the big O? The big O. <laughs> well, that, it was funny. Uh, 
we were at a neighborhood Christmas party and the gentleman's house that it was at was the executive producer for Oprah Winfrey Studios. Prior to that, he was in marketing at John Deere. And we're sitting, sitting there having a good time, cocktail in hand, and there's a knock on the door. My wife is close as his door. He says, go over and open the door. Who do you think standing there? The big O, Oprah is standing there. My wife goes, oh my, you look just like Oprah. And she goes, I am Oprah child. What are you doing here? And the thing that struck me with Oprah was how curious she was, how intently she listened, asked questions and processed the information. And somehow they got on a conversation about Christmas tchotchkes. My wife's a collector. Oprah goes, you really are? Yeah, where are they at? Your house. So Oprah walked down to her house, four, four do doors down, laid down on the couch, and she's had my wife standing up there presenting and talking all about her tchotchkes. But it was it was hilarious that the big O showed up. And then there was another fellow that came with her. He tapped me on the shoulder and he goes, Craig, I know you. I said, you look familiar. I'm trying to figure. He goes, did you go to Bradley? And I said, yeah. Oh, we were in the same marketing classes together. So he was Oprah's right-hand person at the time, but oh, it was funny. hilarious. Small Chicago world. Now, I don't know who you're going to meet in Milwaukee. Uh, it's not going to be royalty up there. So uh, Already did. Yeah? Yeah, our granddaughter was named Jazz Lola. She's eight weeks old. And my daughter, before she told me the name, she goes, you're not going to be able to shorten or make fun of this one. I said, okay, dear, what is it? Jazz Lola. I said, oh, you mean J-Lo or Jay-Z? I met them both up in Milwaukee now. <laughs> And they're related. <laughs> oh, that's pretty good. Um, Craig, thank you so much for joining us today and uh, looking at this topic. Um, I, and I didn't ask permission if we want to go here, but um, so you're going to bring this book out. You're going to help a lot of trusted advisors. What's the end game? What's the legacy game for something like this? Mm. On the contrary, and I'm weird, I'm a frustrated teacher. When I came out of college and wanted to be a teacher so badly, and my girlfriend's father and mother were teachers, so you're not going to get a job. This was back in early 70s. So I found my way into the business profession, marketing and sales. So the most meaningful thing that can happen to me is for somebody to come up to me and say, thank you very much you changed my business and you changed my life. That is what winds my clock. So I'm trying to capture, you know, 100,000 trusted advisors who can say, he helped me. I wouldn't be where I'm at today if I didn't follow some of his direction. That's my, that's my why. Well, that would be incredible impact. And we find that the authors we deal with, they want more credibility so they can have more impact and more influence to help others' lives. Uh, more clients will come along the way. That's a byproduct. It's how can they have more impact? And Craig, you will get those letters. Uh, they're, they're just, they're in the cards, they're coming. So. Craig, thanks so much. Thanks, everybody, for joining us today. That's been this episode of the Marketing with a Book podcast. We look forward to you joining us again as we explore other issues on how agency owners, business coaches, strategic consultants can find new clients by marketing with a book and a speech. Thanks, everybody.